What is the secret to leading transformation? This is the Leaders of Transformation podcast. And on this show, we interview difference makers and world changers who are disrupting for good. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Nicole Jansen. And our guest today is Shobay Agbalusi. Shobay is the founder of Mindset Shift, which is a leadership development company that is focused on developing authentic leaders. He has worked with respected global brands like Google, Spotify, Morgan Stanley, Philips, KPMG, Yale University, HB, HSBC, and many more. He is actually sought after for his ability to help shift perspectives and to install new mindsets that create lasting transformations. And so today we're going to talk about how to do that, how to lead from the inside out, and uh, what is, you know, what is the, the shift that needs to happen from a mindset standpoint so that we can be the leaders that we're capable of being? And so I'm looking forward to that. And uh, so Shobe, welcome to Leaders of Transformation. Nicole, it is an absolute pleasure to, to be here on your, on your podcast. I am, I'm looking forward to this. I'm not used to being on the other side of, of the mic, so this should be quite good. That's right. You have a podcast as well, Everyday Leaders. And so, um, yeah, that's, that is awesome. So we'll have a good time here. I know two hosts coming together. We'll, we'll be tagging <laughs> back and forth. It'll be fun. <laughs> so, well, let's start off with this mindset shift that is most needed in the world right now. What do you think that is? Ooh, I think for me, the, the biggest mindset shift I think is needed is actually around self-awareness. Um, the reason why I lean heavily into that is a lot of what we are seeing play out in the world, personally, I think is based on a lot of self-centeredness approach and a lot of reacting to what people feel like other people need, other people want from them. So whether it's from a company and a corporate perspective or even from a personal um, perspective, I think when I compare how we are right now to where we were, in fact, a couple of years ago with COVID, you can see a massive difference in the levels of empathy and the levels of people really leading into, during COVID in particular, people spend some time like, okay, what's important to me? What role, my family, my friends, all that kind of stuff to spend some time really digging into that. So as the world really opened back up again, that shift started to happen. I want to say to hear a lot more around people feeling burnout, people feeling stressed, people feeling judged. So that for me goes back into why I think the biggest mindset shift that people can really make is really understanding like, who am I? Like, what am I really about? Because that will then help me inform how I operate with myself, how I operate with my family, with my friends, with business, all of those different elements that all kind of come together. But more importantly, it also helps you to operate from a space and a place where you can really hone in on your gifts and your talents. Because if you do that, that's where we see a lot of the innovation in the world. That's where we see a lot of things that are birthed and created in the world. So self-awareness for me is not just a selfish thing. It's actually tapping more into your strengths and what you've been birthed, what God has put you in this earth to do, which then make a massive difference to the rest of the humanity. That's kind of how I see it. Yeah, it's interesting. I think through COVID, it a lot of people um, were, and myself included, to a certain extent. Although we were in this in this work, so we're a little bit more self aware, hopefully. Um, but uh, it kind of it kicked people out of that autopilot, where it's like that wasn't an option anymore. They had to react. They had to respond. They had to check in with how do I feel about this and what do I do now because uh, the pattern was interrupted. And so the regular routine. And so I, I, what you were saying there, I think is, is so true. And when I hear these, you know, th these people talk about, you know, leadership coaches and consultants talk about, and myself included, we talk about what does it take to build great leaders? It keeps coming back to this question of identity, of purpose, of self-awareness, and how can you possibly lead others if you're not first leading yourself? So I think that's really, really important. Now, I know uh, you have a, a story, even your, your own personal experience with this. Maybe you can share a little bit about that, kind of rewind a little bit uh, to where you started and the story you were telling yourself and how you were able to shift that, create some self-awareness and uh, that would that allowed you to do the things that you do now today. 
I think for me the the major shift really started when I was um I was a teenager, I was about 14, 15. Um I was born and born and raised in Nigeria and moved to um the UK when I was eleven. And I spent about three years when I came into the UK really trying to figure out who I was and what was I about. Um, I came into an environment that said that, one, like, you know, you're a black person, so there's a lot of racism, brain of mine come from Nigeria. So that was not my lived experience. So it's a whole different way of incorporating. Not only that, then you've got young, teenage, new environment, so many different things happening around me. I found myself doing things and living up to um, a stereotype, which really wasn't me, which really wasn't based on the foundation that my parents had given me and I've been brought up in. And even though on the outside world, everything looked great, I was unhappy. Like I was so down and out. I remember going to school and spending time with my friends and doing all that kind of different things that they were doing. And I'll get home, I'll just be sad and just be absolutely depressed. And I felt I couldn't really like talk to anyone. But interesting enough, I, I used to do a lot of writing at one time. So I would listen to music, I put some RB music, some slow downs. Um, and it starts to just write and pray and think. And it literally got to the point when I was 14, 15, I just literally felt like God saying to me, like, like, why are you going through this cycle time and time again? Like, what do you have to lose if you were to really just to step into the fullness of who you were? And I remember thinking about it, I was like, well, if I do that, I'm potentially going to lose the so-called friends I have around me because they're going to see a different side of me. If I really do that, I am going to lose, I think there was a girl I was after that point, I'm, I'm going to lose her. If I really do that, I'm going to be that loner kid. And I don't, so those were all the different things. Where I was like, yeah, but then, if you don't do that, what's going to happen to you? You're going to be upset. You're going to be depressed. You're not going to be happy. You're not going to be fulfilled. So which one do you really want to lean into here? And that was literally the conversation I was having back and forth in my mind. And at that point in time, at 15, I made that decision. Like, you know what? I am, I'm going to step into the fullness of who I feel I am, what I've been called in to do. I've always been someone who thought differently. I've always been someone who asked a lot of questions. I was all very curious about things and and people. So like, let me lean more into that. I think for me, that was where I first really made that that shift, that mindset shift for how I'm going to start to live my life. And it was really, really important because I was also in a society at that point in time that was saying, well, you this like Nigerian kid, you're never going to amount to much. Um, with your name, the way it is, people are going to find it hard to pronounce you're going to struggle in in your environment. So it was the teachers telling me all the different bits and pieces. So that was the rhetoric I had around me. When I when I started to make that transformation, it became, okay, I, I see that, I hear that. And yeah, it's, it's going to be hard, it's going to be difficult. But if I can make the decision right now to push back and be myself against the friends I currently have right now and risk losing them, I think I'll be able to navigate everything else because at that point in time, your friends are the most important thing to you in the world. So I'm like, if I can, if I can get through this this period with them, I can start to get through everything else. And that's kind of where it started off, little by little. At that point in time, I didn't, I didn't have a word for it. I didn't know it was down to mindset. I didn't know it was down to like leading from the inside out, right from the outside. That for me was not in my vocabulary at all. What was in my vocabulary at that point in time was currently unhappy. You need to make a change. The change is not going to be easy, but if you do it, it's going to be short-term pain for a long-term gain. Are you willing to be courageous enough to step into that? Are you willing to be obedient into what you feel like God is putting in your heart? And my answer was eventually, it took a while to get to, was yes. And that's where the changes for me really started to kick in. And that's kind of what snowballed over the years for me. So you talk about this idea of losing and I think of winning and losing and how often we focus on what we're going to lose potentially versus what we're going to gain and I so I heard that kind of subtle shift to well I might lose my friends I might lose this girl I might lose whatever this the false sense of belonging in something that you weren't even happy with in in any way but then going to this fullness of life and uh it's just, it's interesting that you were talking about that. And then you said that there were these changes that you need to make. 
Now I could almost hear people who are listening saying, well, what kind of changes did you make? Like, how'd you do it? You know, how do I even know what changes to make? Because if I don't have a picture of it, how can you create something which you don't even have a vision for, right? Like, how, how did you know what the, what were those changes? How did you know that those were the changes that you needed to make uh, so that cool. you could actually create that fullness of life that you were talking about? See, a lot of us actually, we know what makes us happy and what doesn't make us happy. So for me, I knew that when I went into certain environments, when I did certain things, I came out trained. I had conversations with certain people. I came out trained. So it was like, well, if I stop hanging around with this particular crowd, if I stop going to these particular environments, if I stop having these particular conversations, I know I'm going to feel a lot better for it. However, my friends at that point in time were all in those environments. So if I pull back from that, I'm going to lose them. However, I also know there were certain bits and pieces where I'm like, actually, when I talk to that person, I really find I get recharged. When I talk to that person, I don't come away feeling drained. When I get involved in that particular activity, I'm actually quite happy and I, and I learn more and I feel like I'm, I'm moving forward. So let me lean more into that. But then that's not going to be seen as, as cool, as exciting. So it was those kind of things that, for me, were where the separations that had to occur. But in our day-to-day -day lives, normally, we also have that. We know the things that make us come alive and things that don't. We know the conversations that we, we tap into and the ones that we shouldn't tap into the way we do. We even know that when we are busy scrolling on social media, the accounts that we look at and the ones that make us feel good about ourselves and the ones that make us feel really, really bad about ourselves when we lean more into the, that comparison. We know the things that we do at work that we enjoy and the things that we don't. Those things are really relevant. I remember listening to um, spoke about the overall parables, like a parable of two women or man and woman were on a porch and they had a dog there. And this person kept on walking past the dog. And every time you walk past the dog, you always hear the dog whining over and over and over. And one day he just went up to him and was like, I'm curious, like, why is the dog keep on whining and you don't do nothing about it? They're like, oh, the dog is um, laying down on a nail. He's like, a nail? Why don't you just remove the nail? The dog will be fine. Because like, we keep on moving the nail and the dog keeps on finding the nail and laying on top of it. So the dog just wants to be unhappy and make noise. So therefore, we'll let the dog do what it needs to do. And I think a lot of times we are like that. We have times and instances in our lives where we're like, we can easily complain about something, but do we complain and then have the intention to do something about it? Or do we just complain so that we can be heard by other people? That's the realization that for me, I went through that scenario. I was like, I know all this stuff is not good for me. I can keep on complaining about it or I can do something about it. So we all have what that looks like in our lives. And sometimes that's in our family. There's some family members that are toxic for us that we should not be around. And it's hard to do, but it is so necessary to do. So it's being able to take that step back and ask yourself those questions in the different areas of your life. That's when you now know, okay, this is how, and it's it's a bit bad, but you don't do it all at once. You pick a lane, you pick one, you know what? It might be about work. I know this is not right, or this is a, this is a space and place I've been complaining about at work, and I don't want to be there anymore. What are the things that what steps I'm going to start to take right now to move me out of this? So whether it's around putting my CV out there, looking on LinkedIn, having conversations with people, you start to take in intentional steps. But what we see in our lives, regardless of which one we take first, there's always a snowball effect. Because we lead with intention in one area, we're like, oh, I, I did that. Oh, I can do that in this area of my life. And it starts to mount up bit by bit. So that's where the intention really leans in comes from. So what I heard in that too, is that self-awareness that, uh, that you can actually stop and check in with what does bring you joy versus what doesn't and ask those tough questions. Like maybe, yeah, maybe that family member or that friend who is comfortable and, you know, you're familiar with and you hang out all the time, but maybe they're just not that, that great an influence. And uh, I, so, so again, it comes back to the idea of self-awareness because I've actually had people say, and it's interesting. I think it's also when you're, when you've denied yourself so long mm -hmm. that 
you get to that point where you don't even know anymore. I've had people in their fifties and I say, so what do you love? What do you love to do? What brings you the most joy? And they don't even know anymore. That's why we need, you know, we need to teach kids, you know, and help people young before they, you know, they get to the point of numbness and actually just don't even know, but you're right. You know, even then when you prompt them a little bit, they know it's deep down inside. They've just denied it for so long. And, and so they, they, uh, they need that permission to actually go there. It self-permission, give themselves that permission to go there and actually be honest with themselves. You know, so that's good. So let's talk about authentic leadership and how this ties into being an authentic leader. So we, we see a lot of examples of, of leadership. Um, so whether that's in politics, um, whether that's in, in business, but for me, it fundamentally goes back to, I define leadership as it's not just about job or about title, like we all lead ourselves in different ways. So it always goes back to what kind of leader do I want to be? What kind of example do I want to be to myself? Because actually a lot of the things that we do, a lot of the actions that we take is informed by the way that we look at ourselves, by the way that we think about ourselves, by our mindset. Our mindset informs the actions that we think because what you think about is what you put your, um, put your actions to. So I need to start with how do I actually think about myself? And that's where the link with authentic leadership comes from. It now says that, well, when I'm operating, so for example, in my company, when I make certain decisions, am I making those decisions because I saw someone else do that? Or am I, can, am I making decisions that are aligned to my values? Because if I'm making decisions aligned to my values, then I know that regardless of whatever's happening around me in the external environment, I can 100% always say that actually I made a decision based on what I believe and what I see. In in teams, when you're leading teams, when people come to you like, oh my gosh, the CEO just made this decision and I'm not happy with it. Leader authentically can say that, you know what? I'm not happy with it as well. I'm not necessarily aligned to it. That doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to leave the company because there might be times when it's like, you know what, I disagree, but I'm, I can still commit to this. The authentic, authentic part, which actually connects you to your people in those kind of instances, is when you can be real and be like, yes, I'm not aligned to some of the decisions that we made. And I'm, I'm, honestly, I don't understand why we made that, but we are where we are right now. What do we need to do to get on board and to do something with it? Authentic you creates a space for people to be able to pour out and then to move forward. But also the authentic you recognizes that actually, I really do not like that decision that was made and it's not aligned to my values and therefore I need to leave. In you doing that, you also give permission for people to make decisions about themselves. So for me, authenticity is about how are you modeling to yourself? Are you modeling to other people? How are you living true to your values? Because we do not, I think that's where the bit a lot of people have, have a problem with. I remember um, the first team I ever had, proper team I ever had uh, in, in a corporate environment. I was early 20s. Um, most of the people, I think the youngest person in the team I was leading was 18 years um, older than me. So it was a team of well-seasoned, well-experienced um, people who have been in the game you got this young, this young butt coming along, trying to try to teach them um, different bits and pieces. And one of the things that helped me to actually be able to bring them together was every time we sat down together, we had a conversation and they were like, oh, this is, this is what I want, this is what I need, blah, blah, blah. I always came back to them and I was like, yes, we can do this. No, we can't. And they always remarked on the fact that if I always came back to them. Now, for me, that's that was linked into my values, which is if I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do that. That came from me, me being a um, being a father at, at 22, married, kids, all of that kind of stuff. I always said my word is my bond. That's been something that's been day dark value for me. Me carrying that same value into the workplace really helped me to connect with these people who are so 
many, many years older than me. And for them, it was like, wow, we've never seen that before. Something for me that's little, but that's me being authentic. That's me being real, made a massive difference to them. And I think a lot of times we don't see that. We don't see people leading from their values. We don't see people making decisions that are authentic to them. We see people doing stuff or pandering to other people, pandering whether it's to, I don't know, society, money, whatever you want, you want, you want to put on there. That's what we see a lot of. We see a lot of it in, in politics where people are like, how can you make a decision like that where it doesn't seem to be looking after the wide scope of people that you're supposed to lead in, you're making decisions that seem very selfish and are linked to just making rich people richer. People see it in, in companies. How is it that you are recruiting this person who doesn't necessarily have the same experience as this person who's been doing really, really well, but because there's a link with other relationship or this person goes out with you all the time, those person, people keep on rising high and high and those who are really experienced don't. That's where the lack for authenticity is gone. That's where people have been so frustrated. People are looking for genuineness. I've seen spaces and places where people can probably four, five, 10x their salaries sometimes. But because they have great leaders who are authentic, who they, they know they can grow with, who they can trust, they refuse to leave. They're like, yeah, the money might be great, but the stuff I'm learning from this person and the way this person leads, I'm willing to stay because I know long term I'm going to grow and I'll get the money back anyway. That's where the authentic leadership piece kind of comes from. And like I said, it's, I learned that really at, at home. Like my my wife and my kids, like, and they have taught me over the years the importance of being real, being true, being authentic. Like from when my kids were born, I always told them that I'm not going to say, I'm not, I'm not going to have a dad says yes to everything. My thing is either yes, no, or maybe. If it's a no, I'm not going to change my mind. If it's a maybe, then you got some wiggle room. And if it's a yes, it's a yes. And that yes can mean that if you attend something, I remember there's one time I was away and I made a promise to my daughter that I was going to um, attend her, her sports day. I literally left what I was doing, I think it was at 11 o'clock at night, flew back and I came straight from the airport just to attend um, her sports day because my word was my bond. I was absolutely shattered. But it's things like that where, like, that's why I'm very, very careful with my yeses and my kids. But when I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do something. And they know that and they've learned that over the years from me. There's so much in there that that we can unpack. I wanted to um, just touch on that because you, you just mentioned it, is the importance of your word and doing what you say. And talk about it in terms of confidence, what it does to your confidence. And, and if you don't do it, what it does to your confidence as well. So both sides. If you do it, it makes you feel good. There is this, um, I don't know how to describe it. There's this way that you carry yourself. There's this authority that you have. Let's call it presence that you have when you're like, I, I did that, I stuck, I stuck to my word. Especially in situations where it's been really, really difficult to do, you feel a sense of pride and a sense of achievement when you are able to stick to your word. Now, when you don't, on the other hand, you now feel that sense of, man, I, I, don't, I don't feel good. You can feel like you're a failure. I know I've done that. As much as I want to say my word is my burden, there have been times when I have let myself down and let other people down. And I have felt bad. And it really, it's interesting. It, the feeling of not doing it lasts longer than when you actually do it. So that sense of feeling really, really down on myself, feeling like I was not good enough, feeling like I was less of a man at that point in time because my word was not my burden and I let people around me that I loved and cared about down. That lasted with me for weeks when the first time it really, really happened to me. And that's what happens. It's like the the the, the flip side of being, being true to yourself, which you can easily do. That's like, yeah, I've done it, cool. And you just you feel good, you feel great, you feel confident, you feel proud of yourself. And you move on with life. When you don't, that feeling lasts. And that's why I'm like, 
try not to lean lean into that side because that's not what you want because then that becomes a negative spiral and, and cycle so that's the two for me that's where the two sides kind of lie where i know what it's like to be in that space and place i don't want to go there i don't want to do that obviously we're human so it still happens from time to time but i also recognize the fact that it's not a great feeling i want to get more of the good feeling i want to get more of the i've done this for myself and i feel good I want to get more of I've done this for other people and I have achieved one of my other values of feeling like um, I've provided. I want to think about my family or if there's people in my team, for example, you know, what? I've kept my word to that person and I've told them how it is. I've told them what I can do for them. And now they know where they stand and now they can make a decision for their lives. And that's not that's that's how I think about things. That's kind of how I separate the two. But that other feeling, man, it is. I say it's a dark, dark place. Like you don't, sometimes it's right in your face. And there are times when it just creeps up on you when you've let other people down or you've, you've let yourself down. And you might think, oh, it's not a big deal. And then you're about to step into something else and it would just snap in and you just remember and it just debilitates you. That feeling, and, yeah, not a good one. Yeah, it's kind of, it's almost like you're telling yourself in that moment that that not good feeling is, yeah, you didn't do that. What's to say you're gonna do this? Yes, yeah. You're a liar. You know, and sometimes it is literally that. It's like, you know, that feeling of being a failure. And you mentioned about failure, you know, feeling failure in your own eyes. It's so funny. We we want to we want to feel like a success. We want to feel accomplished, but it's amazing. You can have a super successful person and they still feel like a failure. Why? Well, there's several reasons, I guess, for that. I mean, maybe they're not living up to somebody else's expectation. And, uh, but I think some of it is because as much as they might have amassed, and this has been my experience, is they may have amassed a lot of financial success, power, notoriety, and so forth. But deep down inside, they know they're not aligned with themselves. Yeah. They're, they're not, their word is not their, their worth and their bond. And so there's this integrity, they're out of integrity and integrity is being that whole and complete and they're out of it. So, and it ties, it ties back to that other question I wanted to ask you, which is, you know, you were talking about people staying with the company, even though maybe they don't agree with the decision and then others at some point realizing that their values are not aligned and then deciding to leave. And it's like, give us some, maybe some examples, some real life examples of both of those things, because I, I think sometimes, and we are seeing this great resignation where people are leaving and they're saying, hey, I want to go do something else. Um, and and I, I've even seen lots of people who say I need to leave, you know, my job to go become a coach and help others and encourage and build, you know, build, build up others. And it's like, do you, though? <laughs> Maybe you could do it. Right. Like, it's so fascinating. I mean, a little side note. I don't know how many times, you know, people have left. And then fought their way back in as a consultant into the companies. And it's like, you were already there. You could have just stayed there, you know, just <laughs> saying. But anyway, um, and built on that, you know, you didn't have to leave to, you know, to do that. And so you can make a difference right where you are. But, but coming back to this idea of, like I was saying, this question of like, what are some, what are some examples of, you know, of when it's a decision that you might not agree with? And but it's not worth leaving over versus those decisions and or the values that now become things that it's time to leave. Like, how do you know the difference between that? You know, the difference um, when you can take it and think about it and then like, you know, in front of you, a good example, there was um, a company I was, I was working with and I was project man project managing um one of their major contracts and the CEO at that point in time made a decision to basically what's the right word to use he fired probably about 20 people and the way that he fired them and the rationale behind why he fired them was not something that I fundamentally agreed with. However, as much as I was unhappy about that decision, 
I decided that, you know what, this was something that I'm not happy about. I have voiced my concerns, but we're, we're still got to work to do. And that was perfectly okay. I could still carry on working in that environment. I still felt good enough in a sense. I still felt that my values were still intact because I spoke about it and everything else was good to keep on working and operating in that environment. Remember, it wasn't necessarily easy. Contrast that to another environment that I have operated in when the reason why someone was let go of was to do, to do with protecting someone else. So the person that they let go of was like a director and the person that they were protecting was someone in the C-suite. The person in the C-suite had done something wrong and that person had a history of doing things wrong. And the reason why they were protecting that person is he had so much knowledge of an operation of um, the company and there was like a particular piece of software that he really knew well that they hadn't changed over yet and they weren't planning to change for the next two years because it was going to cost them ridiculous amount of money at that point in time. So they couldn't afford to lose him, but they could afford to lose that person and blame that person. I left that company because that for me was like, that's a massive integrity issue. How are you going to keep someone who has a history of doing things wrong? The HR has, but you're protecting that person because it's down to your bottom line. That's not right. That's not fair for me. That's an integrity issue. I had a massive conversation with them, explained to them the reasons why, and I decided to leave. Now, that for me is two separate things. It's still to do with people getting fired, but one for me is this is integrity not aligned to my values and therefore I cannot operate in this environment anymore and, and I need to buy out. One is, okay, I don't like how you did that. Um, I want to stand it to a point and say, but I just don't like the way that you did it. But me not liking something, something being against my values, two different things. That's kind of how I, that's kind of how I see that, how I break it down. And the same with my clients. I find clients where they have operated in environments where Things are happening with either the, the CEOs or whatever, and they are either being um, micromanaged, they are being gaslit, and we're not going and have conversations with them. And they're like, well, why are you still here? It's interesting, a lot of senior leaders in particular are like, well, I don't, I don't feel like I can I can leave. I've been here for 10, 15, 20 years. Like, this is all I know. This is my identity. So I'll... I just feel like I just need to get on with it. I was like, well, what would happen if you didn't have to just get on with it? What would happen if you could start to look at things differently? Would you really want to leave? They were like, yeah, yes, but I'm not sure I can. And that's where the work begins. And we, we end up having those kind of conversations and working that person to start to see things with different perspectives, have that mindset shift. And... Ultimately, I've seen so many clients leave those environments and they are so much more happier and fulfilled and free. But what keeps them there is not the fact that they like their environment. What keeps them there is, is the fear. What keeps them there is I don't think I can leave or I can step out. So I actually think a lot of times the reason why we don't make decisions isn't because we don't know whether this is right or wrong, whether we don't. It's because we feel like we don't have a choice. We feel like we have to. I've, I've been in an environment where I was not happy and it was during the last recession and I was, like I said, I just had a young family. I didn't feel like I could leave. So I stayed in an environment. So obviously the examples I gave to you, I'd grown up, I was in a better position, I could make those decisions and choices. So it even comes down to your, your overall context. Like if you could, would you plant in a seed as small as that? start to see people change their responses and their answers to the way that they they approach things. It now goes from, no, I, I, I'm I still happy here to, well, in theory, if I could, that for me is the difference between being able to know when to, to move from something, when not to, to move from something. That's good. Well, and in that example, I think about the, oh, I can't, I don't have a choice. That's such disempowering language. You know, I find so often, I don't know if you find that with your clients, but a lot of them actually use the language have to a lot, right? I have to do this. I have to do that. I have to, I have to do these meetings. I have to do this. And it's like an external force, 
right? That it's like forcing them to do something. I remember one time I said this to myself, you know, internally, of course, but I'm like, oh, I got, I got all these meetings. I got to do this, I got to do that. And, and I was like, uh, hello, Nicole, you planned your schedule. So if you don't like it, change it, you know? And so often I think when we look at our lives, we feel like we're in a place where we don't actually have that choice to do yeah. that. When in fact, we actually do have the choice and we do create the life that we have. And if we don't like it, we get to change it. I had somebody one time, I said something like, you know, you get to choose or something on Facebook years ago. And this woman was very like, she just went after it because, you know, it's like people don't have the choice and da, 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 and so forth. And it's like, wow, there was such a mindset, uh, ingrained mindset there, you know, about not having choices and freedom and, and options. Some people just don't have those choices in life. And it's like, granted, there are some people and there's sort of some extreme situations, right, of oppression and so forth. But for the most part, most of us are not in that type of situation. The oppression that we feel is actually self-imposed a lot of it, right? Because we put ourselves in positions and we just don't let ourselves actually give ourselves permission to walk away. I think that's down to the society isn't it like we live yeah. in a society that's consistently telling us how we should feel how we should act how we should operate where we should live what we should wear what job and that compounds 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 to the point where you lose your own inner voice or you stop hearing your inner voice should i say yeah you don't have the the silence around you too to you really hear what your heart is yearning for and therefore, what you do here is what you do. And therefore, you don't feel like you do have a choice. It's when we're able to then create environments for ourselves that we can actually hear a voice like, ooh, there's something inside that says I can do something differently. But it seems radical. It's crazy, isn't it? A choice seems so radical in this day and age, but when it shouldn't be. True. Very true. So we've been talking about these mindset shifts. And there's one last one I... I want to talk about maybe if we have the time we'll do another one but there is one that i know you and i talked about previously is work-life balance and you don't believe in it i don't <laughs> believe in it either i know people use that term and it's like so talk about that mindset shift around this idea of trying to create work-life balance there is it, it is it is impossible to have balance between between work and life it's just not possible because something's always gonna have to give um when i started my my career um i was working and then had a baby and obviously my wife's at home at first and then she started her career and then we have another baby and then it's like okay who's gonna go and um because some of my working world and me traveling well that kind of stuff then some of her work started to build up it's like what are we gonna do i was like well i can't i want to be a good dad i want to be a good husband i want to provide for my for my family and kids but at the same time for us to, to move forward from where we are right now to where we need to be um we need to make a choice and decision so i went ahead and she pulled back for for a little while and it got to the point where i was like okay now it's your turn and then she pulled forward and i and i kind of pulled back and there was never any balance. There are times when it's 80-20 or 20-80. There are times when there's stuff that I'm doing where it's 90-10 and vice versa. We hold and we recognize the different roles that we both play in our households. But where the real, um, I, I like to use the word kind of harmony came out is, if you think about it as, as, an, as an orchestra, to get harmony, you have different people playing um, at different pitches at different times. And then you have that conduct the conductor just kind of weaving everything together to make it sound good. But that harmony also goes as ups and downs and ups and downs, as ebbs and flows as like a wave. And that's kind of how I see um, I see life. That's how I see work and life. Right now I'm currently it's what eight o'clock on, on, on in in my time zone kids at home my wife's currently currently gone out as soon as I finish this I'm gonna have a um, my daughter's already sent me a message I'm gonna spend um 45 minutes an hour with her before she goes to bed because she's like daddy I want some daddy time I'm like cool that for me is how I get both where I can do what I'm doing in, in my business during the day when my family is not around 
in the evenings. I might have some meetings or spend some time with my family and then have some dinner together and then spend some time with my wife and then we go to bed. It's not like, okay, I've got four hours here. This is me time. And then go, it never, it's never going to work. My kids are <laughs> the teenagers. So there's going to be times when they want to spend time with me. There's going to be times when they don't want to spend time with me. There's nothing ever prescribed. It's been so open and spontaneous. So I, that's why I'm like, when people chase balance, you're never going to get it. What is it you're ultimately trying to do? What is you're ultimately trying to create? Part of the example I just gave right now is me and my wife were in constant communication about what is important to us at that point in time. What is important to us, what we're trying to achieve from whether it's a financial perspective, what is it we're trying to achieve from a long-term perspective, what are the things that she wants to do from her career and how can I support that and vice versa? The communication helped us to be able to get to that harmony rather than saying, oh, we're just going to block things out. That, that just doesn't, doesn't work. I've never seen anyone achieve balance. We listen to a lot of um, I don't know, successful founders and CEOs of the companies and they talk about there is no balance. Um, I remember the, the, the guy's name now from Netflix. And he talked about every, I think every Tuesday for the last 25 or 30 years, he always finishes at five and goes away and has dinner with his wife. That's it. He's done that every year for the last 25 years, regardless of whatever meeting he's had. But then he also said in the rest of his book, during the rest of the week, there are times when it's absolutely crazy. That's not, people will be looking at me like, well, you have dinner once a week with your wife and you finish a particular time. Yeah, that's absolutely amazing. But then if your rest of the week is crazy, is that really balanced? It's like, no, it's not balanced. But me and my wife had a routine. She knew what we were doing. We knew what we were building. We had our own way of operating and it worked for us. And they're still successfully married. They've had some, some great kids and, and so forth and so forth. So it's about recognizing what is important to you. What is your harmony what does your harmony look like and what season or what part who's playing what instrument in that particular um harmony that's kind of how you start to look at things and think about things but like i said there were instances where people would look at my life and be like bro you are on the road like there was a point last year for about four months i was literally on the road and it was absolutely crazy it was absolutely chaotic absolutely busy and then came to December, I was like, right, I've got three weeks off. I'm doing absolutely nothing. Cancelled all my meetings. And I just spent time having fun with my family. People like that might not look like balanced to people. I'm like, yeah, it doesn't. It's not balanced. But we have harmony. My kids know who I am. We have great conversations every single day. We can lean in out and talk about stuff. And I can be real with them around what I'm doing, what they want from me, what they don't want from me. Exactly the same thing with my wife. That for me is, is harmony. That's what I try to do rather than having everything blocked out. Or in, in, no, I want the people around me who love me to know that I am available to them, but they also recognize the fact that I'm also building and growing something for them. But I also recognize where they are in their lives and I can also create that space and time when they need it. That for me is what I, I strive to achieve in my life, in my, in my personal life, in my professional life is what I work with my clients on helping them to identify what their harmony kind of looks like and then working towards that. Well, I feel like there's this, this sense of freedom in that. And it takes a little bit more, it seems like it takes a little bit more work to create harmony than balance, but it actually is only intentional. It's more intentional than I hear when you were just describing that, even like that work-life balance is so often we get into this mechanical this mechanical mindset, right. Of like boxes, you know, it's like, great. If I put these in, I'll live in those boxes. It just made me think of, I will ask you one more question. I know we're, we're getting towards time here, but um, how often when we talk about creating psychologically safe environments, which I know you talk a lot about with your clients is that they want to create these boxes, what that looks like diversity inclusion, Oh yeah. Okay. So this is the box. We'll fill the box, check it off. And it's very mechanical. A lot of it versus creating a sense of this harmony, just very two different approaches to it. So can you, and I know that's a big topic, but can you kind of briefly talk about this? How do you help when you're creating these, these psychologically safe environments using harmony? 
Um, I'm going to use an example of, I think it's um, a framework that I think works really, really well for, for me in this. Um, there is, I'm sure you heard about, so you, you would have, it's the Kinevin framework, which is um, a sense-making kind of framework that came up with from Dave Snowden. And why I really like it, when we switch when we talk about topics like this, is it's, it's not a typical two by two kind of box. In fact, the way that the lines are designed is not to have boxes because they flow in and out of each other. Now, what we tend to find normally is people think about, um, let's, let's use DNA as an example, in boxes. And it's like, okay, this is the approach we're gonna take. We're gonna do X, Y, Z, and this is gonna give us this particular result. Right. Okay, in two out of 10, maybe. But the reality of it is when you're dealing with people, people are complex and therefore you cannot put them in a box. When I when we have psychological safety sessions, one thing I always start with is like, as we talk, there are going to be so many different things that come out as we are having a conversation. I don't want you to hold anything back. I want you to just lean into that and let them out. Now, that means that just because I've got a couple of slides to share, we might not get to that. There have been so many sessions that we've stayed on slide one because what I'm leaning into is emergent. I'm probing the room. I'm sensing what's there and I'm responding. It's very, very emergent. It's very, very risky because you never know what's going to come out. You never know what people are going to say. And therefore, people get really, really scared to be able to do that. Like, oh, what this person said this? And no. So they want to lean into the, the complex... Also, the complicated kind of approach was nice, neat, box. I know what people are going to say here, good practice, but never works. The environments where I've seen real change happen have been the ones where it is very much open. And people are, generally speaking, complex. People are looking at things from so many different lenses, whether it's around race, gender, um, religion, um, sexuality. There's so many different things that people are coming from. Because back to what I said right at the start, we filter things through our experiences. We filter things through our own way of, of mini-making. Therefore, I can't have a boxed approach. I need to have a complex approach which allows things to flow and things to be emergent. When we do that, people can really and truly express themselves. And then what that allows me to, to hear is, oh, this is what's in the environment. This is why these people do not have psychological safety. This is why these people feel like they cannot speak up. This is the real work that needs to be done. And man, that work is also very hard. That also is very tough. I'm not sure we can necessarily change all the different bits and pieces, but we can start because I might not be able to change 20 things, but me starting to do some work to change five of them makes those people feel seen, makes them feel heard, makes them feel appreciated because I am leaning into what you have shared with me and starting to do something about it, as opposed to we're going to do A, B, C, D, E, F, G without anyone really being consulted. And it's like, okay, we've ticked the box, but you haven't really helped anyone because you haven't really listened to what's at play here, why I'm feeling, why I'm not feeling safe. Those are the two different approaches. One is very, very hard to be able to contain, but it's so rewarding, it's so rich, it's where the real shift really, really happens. And one is defined, prescribed. You can tick a box with it. You can make you feel good, but it doesn't really make change. That's where you have the differences in both. I love that. I love that. Thank you so much, Chope. I, I appreciate it. And, and just giving us ideas as to how to shift those mindsets, you know, or from where we're used to, or maybe what the world has told us to some other uh, options. And I think that's, uh, that's a great place to land uh, this conversation. And really, uh, in I encourage our listeners to go to, you know, your website, mindsetshift.co.uk. Of course, it's all be in the show notes. But uh, as we as we finish up, is there anything that you like final thoughts, uh, just to kind of leave our listeners with if they're looking to lead from the inside out? I guess my final thought um, around that would be when you make decisions, spend some time and ask yourself, where's this really coming from? Is this coming from me? Is this coming from 
someone else is coming from my environment. And that's where you really start to enable you to be able to make the choices that aligns to the life that you really want to live rather than the life that other people want you to live. That's good. Thank you so, so much. I've enjoyed this. This is great. So I keep thinking, right. man, so there's so many more questions. <laughs> yeah, I, I can, uh, I can see that as you work with your clients, you just, there's an expansiveness to your conversation. There's simplicity. And yet at the same time, very much an expansiveness to the conversation. So I love it. I love it. So, so I just encourage our listeners and our viewers to go to Chopay's website, mindsetshift.co.uk. Of course, that's like I said, it's going to be in our show notes and check out what he's doing. He's got some great resources on the site, uh, other podcast episodes he's done and check out his own podcast, you know, and so we'll make sure all of those links are in the show notes. I believe that leaders of transformation take action, take action on something today. Even that final thought that uh, Chopin is left with us is just to ask yourself those thoughts that you have, those, that inner dialogue, where is that coming from? Is it coming from you? Is it coming from someone else? Is it coming from society around you? What, what is driving those thoughts? What's driving that mindset, which are determining the decisions you make, which is ultimately determining the results that you get. You do that, you'll uh, be on your way to creating a new perspective, shifting your perspective, shifting your mindset and creating uh, a better life for yourself. And, man, you know, talk about your kids. We've been talking about show based kids here tonight, you know, today, like think about the next generation, the mm. example that you'll be able to set for them that as you take charge of your own life and you lead authentically, that you'll give them the freedom and the permission. And they'll give them an example to follow uh, for their lives. So I encourage you to that. We'd love to hear your stories. Go on leadersoftransformation.com. You can find us on social as well. We'd love to hear your story. And we look forward to seeing you next week and another episode of the Leaders of Transformation.